ways. You're listed in here as Elberon, Pennsylvania. So it took me a long time of research before I realized where Celeron was, and it made it so much happier for me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you uh, something about the lake. I'm from Sharpsville, and this, these are the approximate populations of these towns uh, in 1895. Sharon, who's going to move up to Celeron, and I'm going to, I have about three pages just on Celeron alone. Anyways, there's 7,000. This is um, a steel belt area where this town's going to grow up to have the 13th largest steel mill in the country, and Youngstown's going to have the sixth. And this is Niles. This is a new team you guys are going to be playing this year. And in this area today, they're going to be drawing off 250. There's Franklin, there's Oil City, and Titusville. Well, at the turn of the century, this place has more oil than Texas. This, this is just approximation. And you're going to find that these two teams, they're going to have, uh, I found something with Rockefellers were worth $175 million in 1895 because the one daughter is getting married. So these two teams, there's going to be a salary limit of $600 per season. And they have this rivalry. They're going to go up to $1,300, and that's ultimately going to cause the league to collapse because the other teams are going to be forced to try to match the $600 and Sharon who's is going to have to move up to Celeron. We also have uh, Erie and Meadville and Warren. These two teams, uh, this is Twin Cities. There's no Twin Cities. And this population is still about the same today. It's like Denison and Yuridsville. They played back then a split season, which was actually interesting because that way they had ultimately a championship game. And then Wheeling, and again, you're going to see they're 34,000, and they're going to have a, a strange uh, finish where they're basically in fifth place. They come in third place, and they have a playoff with the first place team Warren, and Newcastle gets cheated. Dollars, you know, a future vice president. I'm, I'm going to tell you about some of the stars I found. Well, first of all, that's down near Butler, and he's uh, he's in the Hall of Fame. He still holds the record for the most strikeouts one season by a left-hander in the American League. That's uh, I think 349. Now Newcastle, they have probably the three most interesting players. Um, right around 1869, they made that tour of the country, the Red Stockings, the one that won like 69 or 70 in a row. And in 1871, they formed a players association. Well, this guy shows up in 71, plays for Royal City in 74, and he's on with the Chicago White Sox in 84 as world champions. This guy here, Link Lowe, he's the first guy ever to hit four home runs in a game. I'm tracking him down in Newcastle. This guy, Charlie Bennett, he's he's on um, four world championship teams. And the Cubs and all these other teams, they say the reason Boston doesn't win it in 94, he's out on a hunting expedition in Kansas with a future Hall of Famer, gets off the train, makes a phone call, and he slips on the ice and the train cuts his leg off. So this other guy's named Clarkson, who's in the Hall of Fame, he can't handle it. He ends up going to an insane asylum. Then it recovers, and he ends up um, living to be, you know, probably for that turn of the century, about 80 years old. I'm going to tell you this story here. He has the most fascinating story of the whole league, is everybody, um, when you get a tightness in your leg, the first thing you think of is a Charlie horse. That's what you call it. And I'm, I'm estimating it's been said over a billion times in the American lexicon because if you say it four or five times in your lifetime and there's uh, 200 million people in the United States, well, anyways, he's the originator of that phase. And what happened, he was down playing for Louisville in the major leagues, double-A American Association, and he had a tightness in his leg. And the guy said, he said he had a Charlie horse, and the guy asked him, "What do you? How do you explain that?" And he said he had two horses. His dad used to haul dirt or ice, 
whatever he hauled, the horse would get the cramp, and the horse's name was Charlie. So that phrase was taken <laughs> off out of this Newcastle guy that everybody used. That's interesting. So this guy, Jack Dunn, he comes out of Meadville, and that's where Babe Ruth, the film we just saw, gets his name. He's, um, they call him Dunn's baby. Everybody signs that piece of paper. Well, Franklin, uh, they start out with a $1,300 team. And Oil City, who has about a $1,300 team, they dismantled her. So Franklin's going to win the first half, uh, mostly through cheating. And they're going to end up, the league's going to fold. They're, they're going to fold. And how much are they going to fold by? About $1,200. Or had they stuck to the original agreement of $600? And Rod, can I stop for a second? Yeah. The Iron and Oil League, when was that created? Where? The when? At what time? What, what was it like? It was 1895, that spring, the earliest I have found is that guy, Hecker, from Youngsville. He's down in, um, down in Meadville, trying to get Meadville in the league. And that's the league that Jamestown dominated in 1991, and so they don't get in the league. And so the 1895, the Iron Oil League, is this is its first year here. It's its first year, and they make that $600 agreement and warns the last team to enter the league. Salary cap. Yes, they had a salary cap. And in fact, three years after, I was researching uh, up on the, on the microfilm today and, and over Bradford, their tightness wheels talking. They say there's no use us entering this 1898 league because Franklin will never keep the salary cap. Franklin applies, everybody's mad at him, and they won't let him in. But now I'm going to tell you something about the dirty baseball they played back then. And this went through a major reform, and this, this blows your mind away, but um, if you were throwing the ball and somebody was trying to, if, if you're at bat, and again, everybody identifies Connie Mack with being a saint, and you get ready to swing the bat, you have two strikes, they tip the bat. Today, that's interference. Uh, back then, it wasn't. So this Franklin, Franklin was notorious for dirty play. They had all the league, by the end of the year, warns the one, they all, they all hate Franklin. And put it in perspective, the teams that won the most championships, uh, like Baltimore and that, they're noted for being dirty. So Franklin's just copying the major leagues. Like I read this article on uh, John McGraw, who's in the Hall of Fame, and you have one umpire. So one umpire can't see everything that's going on. So let's say they hit a fly ball to right field. It's going to be close to the line. He runs a little bit down the first base line to follow this. You're tagging up on third base. Well, back then they wore these big belt buckles with joining the bra would grab the belt and just hold it long enough so that the guy, and then by the time the umpire looked, he would leave go. So that Pete Browning from Louisville, he unbuckled his belt in this one game. And they said Johnny McGraw was standing there with his belt by <laughs> So anyway, you, you have a lot of that. Uh, and they have another place, uh, major, major umpire fight where this guy, his name's Keith, he's the best umpire in the league. He's, he's elderly, you have young guys in their, their 20s, they're going to the major leagues. This is Franklin, and they're arguing with him. And the one guy smacks him up here, which would turn your body this way. Then the other guy smacks him, brings him back here. And they're doing this like five, ten times a row until Oil City comes out and rescues them. And then naturally, like, you're always trying to intimidate the umpire into ruling in your favor. Because in any ways, they have a big get to do about whether, uh, you know, that umpire says he'll never come back to that time. The fans are very... At least two or three times, this is Franklin, Don Newcastle, Sharon. They throw sticks and stones at the player. And this is my favorite one, railroad spikes. <laughs> and so Franklin, Franklin's field sat up against the hill, and that would be like the bleacher bombs. These people would pay money, but they'd watch the game, and you had no helmet to put on your head. So when they were throwing railroad spikes at your head, 
you know, and you're kind of watching them, then the ball could get by you. If, if you wanted to go to Sharon today, uh, you would take 62 from Warren, and it's about a three hours drive down, down to there. And the owner, Sharon, and this is something I want to stress, the whole time this team comes up to Celeron, this is a Sharon-owned team. It's not Jamestown, it's Sharon. His name's W.C. Harrington, and your paper spells it wrong. It's H-E-R-R, not H-A-R-R. And that, that's real common for them to make spelling mistakes back in then. And they're actually a good ball team. When every, when the start of the season starts out, they're nine and six. They're in first place, and then one month of the season's gone by, but then that's when the law of Franklin, which I, I say kicks in. Franklin's playing its players twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month. They have two uh, major leaguers on their team. Their, their names are, are McDaffrey and Niles. Well, Connie Mack farms them out. He comes up, watches some of the Franklin games at least twice in the season. So those two guys alone are making $500 a month. So that, that team's going to dominate. Well, then all the, the weaker teams like Sharon and Titusville, <clears throat> they have to uh, try and compete, and they start getting uh, bumping their salary up to eight or $900, and then they're hurting for money. Warren, why does Warren not give money go above the $600 limit till the very end of the season. Warren's playing baseball down at the hospital and the fairgrounds are having a centennial. They build this park, a new park, and that's the front runner. It's called Russell Park. It went through like three name changes, the high school that I know of, and it's Russell Park. And that's the one where Babe Ruth and Josh Gibson hits a home run. So they build that, and that they start open that right around July 4th. And uh, anyways, so they put four or five thousand dollars into the stadium, and that's why Honus Wagner, here's this superstar coming up. He, he'll play for thirty-five dollars a month, where you know McDaffrey and Niles they're getting five hundred dollars just those two players. And what I found unusual about the Warren Stadium, they have, <laughs> they have backs for chairs. They order like. 740 folding chairs. I don't know if they're stadium chairs from Union City. So more about Sharon. Sharon has one guy that goes to the big leagues. This is his name's Gussie Gannon. He's 19 years old. He's mowing down the league. Sharon's nine and six. And how do you evaluate a baseball team? Well, you want to send them into the big leagues. They send this guy into the big leagues. Sharon never recovers. I mean, they get terrible. And I can't figure out why. He only pitches one game in the main leagues for Connie Mack. He lets up one run in five innings. He gets the win. And Connie Mack releases him. He goes up the Eastern League. And the Warren paper says he throws a 4 3 2 no hitter. But they also say he's doing bad. So I, I figure he, he's real inconsistent. He's a lefty, typical lefty. There you go, Russ. Don't touch that. Don't go there. So this, this league, what makes it also hard is like there's about 250 uh, players that are going through the leagues because you have this league pulled up in New York, somewhere up like in El Elmira, you know, uh, Ornholmesville and that, Dansville, they're in the league. Team, he asked me this before, and he said, well, how do you know this? And this is how the story so is. This is at Celeron Park. Yeah, yes. Yeah, Celeron Park. So this, this comes out of the Warren paper. It says four home runs were made today. Hundreds of them will result before the season closes if a netting of some kind is not put up along the lakefront. Not more than a two, a good two base hitch would be made if, you know, if the netting was put up. So we know that the original park has no uh, fence over it. And all the other ones, I always hope they hit the home run over the fence. And anyways, uh, what else? is like when Sharon came up, they never bought the field. They actually leased it. And this, this just gives you a description. This comes out of your newspaper. It just says the ball grounds are almost enclosed by the skating rink, the rink promenade, the bowling alley, and bathhouses. 
and I was telling Greg I haven't been able to find this, but they had some type of rule where you couldn't enclose off an area and make money. So what they they did is they they sort of circumcised the rule or circumvent or whatever. Yes. You don't want to circumcise it. <laughs> no, it really hurt. So, yeah. But they made a gate going in this fence, and then you have these prominent uh, buildings around it, and then that way they could charge people. And I've been able to find, just through your newspapers for that summer, up on Chautauqua, I'm not sure, I think that was a separate field, where 2,000 people go to a game. How many people would Celeron have needed, or the rest of the league, to uh, last? They needed about 400 people a game. Uh, that gives you an idea what the attendance would be. Now this is something, this comes out of your newspaper, it says Prince Leo's going to make a, a balloon ascension, and he's gonna jump out of the balloon one mile high. Because when the league folds, they're gonna say, why does the league fold? And the Jamestown newspaper says they base it on uh, people want to see the balloon ascension. And I'm gonna tell you a lot about that. So here it says 345 baseball. Here it says 4 p.m. Prince Leo Grand Balloon Ascension. So I'm down at this other library. Back then they didn't take a lot of photos and they have what they call sketch artists. So what this guy had to do back then was go up in a balloon. And I, I parachuted six times, so I, I know what happened. And you, he didn't have a parachute like that. He had this like canopy and it was wood. So you would have to jump out and hold on to it. Now the, the biggest thing, it takes about three seconds for a modern day parachute to open. So the whole time, and you have to be perfectly symmetrical, like if this hand's like this, you are tumbling and out of control. And it's the same, I, one time I, I only made six jumps, I was scared to death, and I was only out there for three seconds. Then when the chute opens, it lurches you up. Well he had that wooden thing and he'd be holding on, of course he had no emergency chute, if your hands got tired, you let go. Birds come in the face or whatever. So anyways, uh, people wanted to see that more than the baseball game. <laughs> now, this is where like, like Greg, Greg wrote a position paper on the Jamestown um, team, and he, he defends, he's from Jamestown, about that they have you know, they had adequate coverage of the games where somebody else had written that they did it. Well, so I'm just gonna tell you, you put all the teams together, you give them A's. After everything I have seen, I give Jamestown Sports page an F. So we'll go into that. Now, I'm just gonna tell you. I was a homer. What can I tell you? <laughs> Anyways, they're, they're really, in 1898, they're doing everything right, but I blame it on what I call their they're sending up a team in mid-season with no, you know, not oriented to Jamestown. But um, like here, here's a, I made these all for Greg, but this comes out of your paper. This list of players that played. No, it doesn't have their name. Or all these other, um, there's no box scores. There's nothing. It, and so, it, anyway, <laughs> so these other, other papers all have box scores when they're home, and they all have line scores. A lot of times, and they kind of make jabs at Jamestown. They say, "Get into the game, Jamestown. Get into the game." <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, we've I come a long way. way. I might add, we've come a. <laughs> I, I just broke brought this down. This is some loose stuff. Before I get to here, this this just shows you had cricket. You asked me for that before. Yep. Yeah, you could. Now I, I bought a minor league book. It's like like that book you have. It might be a newer edition. But anyways, you, you guys wrote this book. Greg, Greg talked me into coming down my first time in Jamestown and buying it. It was a good book, but it's incomplete. I'll just tell you, like in the back, it lists your major, it lists your teams here, and you go from 1890, 91, 95, 98 up to 1914. Well, I bought a book like that for 60 bucks to see if it could help me. Here's, uh, you're listed in the minor league, D Interstate, 1905. You're playing Cottersport, Geary, Olean, Bradford, Kane. Kane guy hits 352. You only, 
And then you move the do voice. Anyways, so that I'll give you that. You're also in the 1906 team. So you have continuity. Um, you're playing like, you're actually, this is a, your Royal City Jamestown. So, uh, and there's like Erie, Punxsutawney, Bradford. Anyway, this is all from that. I'm not sure I'm inviting you back, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, they play the split season. And um, the season, the first half ends July 15th. And Sharon, Titusville, Franklin, Franklin's heard it in the middle of May. They're whining to the papers. And, and Meadville, they're, they're funny because Meadville's not in the league, and they, they make fun of Franklin. I mean, don't, don't, don't put the jabs in, but so we move, up, we move up around July 16th. Sharon loses their moment of glory because Honus Wagner signs up right around July 11th. And so they never get a chance to play against the greatest player ever, Honus Wagner. So I, I would just, um, the link, I'm going to just give you reasons because of the story and why you would say the link failed. <coughs> First, you had the $600 limit. The next year, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, that's where Ed Bar Barrows of uh, Wheeling would go to, and he'd get Honus Wagner to go there. Their limit's $800. Anyways, this was a very reasonable figure, and they agreed to this figure in 1898, your seller on seat. Uh, and Franklin, the first half, had the unfair advantage of going, every, all the teams signing up to a $600, that's the total players, and the amount of salary they could have, and Franklin starts out with about $1,200, $1,300. Now this, this is, again, this is, this is a big one, this is my favorite, next to the salary cap. The original schedule was for 44 games, 44 the second half, or 88. The league's hurting financially. You're smart enough, you want baseball to last. So they make the adjustments. They reduce it to 40 games, the second half, and there's just going to be 84 games. Well, like on a snap three-day decision, they bring in these two teams, Wheeling and Twin City, whose league has folded and who are financially very successful into the league. With these, now you have an eight man, an 18 league. The second half is 56 games or 100 total games. What does that mean to you people? Today, you have 76 games. That's how many you play, because that's what I picked up on our sports page. Celeron and Sharon made a total of 73. So if they hadn't brought those other two teams in, that was the most baseball you're getting close to you know being baseballed out so anyways uh, if they could have hung on for another two or three more games or actually uh, seven they could have made it but then when they went to this hundred game season they, they couldn't see any end in sight and the league folded other reasons why the league failed at teams it also has to come out in West Virginia in southern Ohio, more money lost. I call it a uh, poor location of stadium. You're five miles away, which back then, <coughs> the average working man worked 10 hour days, and all the other stadiums are basically in town except for Royal City, and that's in between Franklin. And uh, the Warren Papers, was there a town called Croydon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, like they have this thing going on where the Croydon players are saying, the fans are saying start the game at 3:30, and the others are saying start at 4 o'clock, and they can't get home at night, you know, where it's safe. So that those five miles matter. The the original team that, that come up to Sharon was not designed to draw Jamestown fans as a rule of thumb. They stuck it in Celeron Park which they, I think they built in 1893, and right around 1894, uh, they built the baseball stadium, but it's in, like those bathhouses are three stories high. Everybody out there knows baseball being played during circle, and they can't get the, you know, the three to 400 people to come to a game to save their league. 
I, I put this other factor in. I call this the uh, the one or two timers. Like, I'm a, I love baseball, but I'm only going to go over to Niles once a year. Well, in hindsight, Jamestown, New York, did not know that Sharon's going to move up to Celeron. They made their one excursion down to Warren to watch the game. Second, Warren had a centennial, and this is a major event, 25,000 people coming into Warren, a lot from Jamestown, New York. Well, out of those 25,000, uh, the Jamestown fans have exhausted their desire to see baseball. They've seen it once or twice, that's enough. Now we know this is the only accurate count ever for a double header for all three, uh, all six teams at that time was 11,100, whatever it was around there. But So we know that nearly 2,000 people were going to a game and if they would have stuck to the salary cap and balanced the good days with the bad days, like when you guys have rain outs or cold weathers, they could have made it. Lastly, as I told you, Sharon was about nine and six when uh, they went into what they call on the toboggan. And I look before they come to Celeron, they go like two seventeen and three. That could be two and twenty, or it could be five and seventeen. And I have a few games to put together. So you're asking people to come and see a ball game. It's two and seventeen first, and then they start out zero oh and six. Well, who wants to come and see a team? You know, you're on your family vacation. That's uh, in last place and goes zero oh and six. Anyways, I didn't know. Um, now we're going to contemporary Jamestown baseball. Just a, how can you draw off Western Pennsylvania out of Sharon? People like me that we have third generation um, hunting camps up here, and people come up in the summer to come at least you know once every two or three. Game. So anyways, I, I just wrote down like Tour Old Stadium, Half Price Day, T-shirts. But I was going to, by writing the book, try to, that would be my goal, would be to get people to come up here to your stadium and ensure that baseball will survive. Because like I told you, Niles is going to be drawing off 250,000 people. Anyways, I can't be at one place at all the time, like last night they stayed at the Holiday Inn, much more expensive than ours, um, also much better too, I mean, the mar no comparison. And I didn't know if you had any interest, but the big, if you could compile, just take your time, if there's any interest, if not, I don't even need an answer today, but I wanted to tie the book in with high school sports, and all, that's pretty easy. I can't tell you why, because that's my own ideas, but uh, new, there's also Newcastle. I was going to tie into the early development, and I didn't know if you had interest in that, but that's what, that, that's a theme I would try to run through for at least two books. And that is up to me, who you guys are entrusting. I actually don't. <laughs> And that, that is how I would try to get the people through my book long term. <laughs> All right. And I think that concludes everything I have to say. You have any questions about the team or which team which cities were were the twin cities in Ohio? Denison and Uriksville. And incidentally, um, Cy Young comes out about 20 miles from there, so they bring up somebody, Cy Young. Uh, the Pirates go up and play Twin Cities at least one year, and I see the Washington Senators play them, and Cy Young's brother's a catcher, and does play a little bit in this uh, minor league Twin City team. Is it is it on the river, or is it in a little? It, it's in a way, it's, in a, okay. it's rural, it'd be like, they haven't changed any in the, the population. Uh, okay. Was it near uh, the Steubenville area or Marietta? It's out. It's out in the Boondocks. Okay. So it's not actually the Steubenville team. That's the one that Honus Wagner went to first. 
and it folded like in about two weeks because of poor financial investments. And then it goes up to Akron and Mansfield, Ohio, and then it goes over to Michigan. He's 21 years old. He's, he's a real shy person. And all these uh, other players that were playing with him in Akron and Steubenville, they're over in Warren. So he puts the team, and he'll come over for 35 a month. What got you interested in this? Again, this book just dumbfounded that uh, Sharon has a baseball team. Actually, I'll, I'll tell you this, there's closer to 35 major leaguers that come out of this league, and I've been tracking them, and I have, <coughs> I've made like master schedules, I fill that all in. I have rosters where players are here for two weeks. Like I'll tell you, there's a deaf and dumb guy goes five for five, he gets two walks. Today, you couldn't say this, but they'll always make fun. Well, I guess he won't be saying a word about this. <laughs> and, <laughs> you have political incorrect statements, I keep a foul on that, like somebody's throwing a lot of balls. This uh, pitcher, he's wilder than a lunatic. You know, you couldn't say that today. And there's African Americans playing baseball down there. Uh, in some of these leagues in the 1884s, and I just, that's so why I got interested. And now, so for my whole life, I've always identified with about 1901 or so when the Pirates and New York Giants, those were my two teams. Now, I flip flop, this is my favorite all time stuff, and I'd like to publish a, a book. And if it works, I know I could sell to, to the local newspaper, all the historical societies. That's a realistic, but dreamwise, I think, like Society of American Baseball Research, like that guy Bennett and Lowe who I'm tracking, that guy uh, Joe Quest, that this fills in the years. Now, just 1874, you think of the Rolling Stones going on their world tours. Well, Jamestown, they get, I mean, Newcastle gets real good. I picked up, you guys are playing baseball, 1874, just down from Newcastle. Newcastle wins 18 to 2, but anyway, that's probably one of the few wins on the tour. <laughs> but that's why I, I like to start. Every story has to have a beginning, and I can take you four towns now where I can say 1866, this is where baseball started, and it's all going to end in 1899, Volume 1. And anything in between, I'm going to be a steamroller and pick it up. So you're looking at three or four years work, but that's what I like to do. And, when I tell this to my sisters on the phone, they say five minutes, four minutes, 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so you're the first people that I can say I've ever been able to talk to without like getting the five minute speech. So thank you. Are you finding many photographs in your research? Well, Franklin, Royal City has an 1892 field photo of Sedgwick Park. Now, the only other thing I found, there was an 1876, the founding of the National League. Newcastle has in their library in their manuscripts, and, and back then they, they wrote on linen paper, so that type of paper lasts, but they have like 40 places that they wrote to um, major league uh, or teams that come play with them. Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, like, this is where, like the Warren papers, years later, they, they rewrite history, they say, Honus Wagner came up here. Connie Mack came out to meet him, 1895. Pirates in first place, that's why he came. Well, when you research this league, you'll find out Connie Mack goes up, plays three days in a row. Cleveland comes down, plays Titusville, Oil City, Franklin. They're pitching Cy Young. This guy, Roby Walls, in the Hall of Fame. Pirates, they're, uh, they come up three times. They play Newcastle, Warren. They play uh, Franklin. So really it was just, that's where like, I know there's a lot of history. When you bring major league teams that are coming up, that's how good this league was. And Celeron and Sharon were really bad. And, <laughs> but they weren't coming up. And Honus Wagner signs up like July 11th. And they've actually made the agreement like July 9th. They're coming up to see his brother, Al Wagner, and some other players. But when you have major league teams I mean, uh, I never knew Boston Red Sox, or whatever they were called, Boston Bean Eaters. They're world champions. They come up and share in 1894. 
Nobody knows that. If I pick that up and uh, for that, Charlie Benedict gets his legs cut off. <coughs> so I've really become engrossed in this uh, in this league. And but so that's that's my eventual goal to try to deflect. There's a lot of old Bob money over there in that Niles area, Youngstown, and send it up this way. And there's everybody in our area, uncle or family has hunting camps. How can you attract them to come up once every two or three years to your stadium and you know buy a hot dog and all that stuff that goes into making a baseball team successful? So, any other questions? So your ultimate goal is two, three, four books, or is it uh, one combination of books? Well, it's called the work factor. If I make enough money, I can, like, I'm a nurse, I can go down to three days a week. But it's, uh, it's very time consuming. Um, but that's the ultimate problem. Second, on microfilm, at the turn of the century, they didn't microfilm these newspapers till like 100 years later, like in the 70s. So it's poor quality. Your eyes can only look at it in two or three hours. If you have good eyes, if you have bad eyes, you can look at it a half hour or less. And I have these masks. I have like 50 notebooks in this one room. I get to, I have barbs now. Like I like this one. There's more. Back then they would fight like more. Um, the Bradford Era News said something like, uh, "Well, you have." Don't join the Iron and Oil League. They're t talking to Punxsutawney or else you'll look at all the fighting up there. And Bradford replies, uh, uh, Bradford is nothing but a town of, like, something about the men, da da da, and loose and lewd women. That's all they say. Like, don't we'll fight back and forth. <laughs> Not like Kane, one newspaper, they start a newspaper, and Warren will say, Kane needs another newspaper like a dog has two tails. And they, they just come up with these little barbs. And, uh, so I keep a track of these war, I call them war wards. And they get into these, and the other paper, newspapers all pick up like these war wards, they call them, where like being wisecratching, making that they have survived. And I think that would like enliven the book up by having those barbs in. Oh, yeah. Uh, is there any primary sources? I know there's nobody alive, obviously, but any primary sources other than newspapers that you have access to? Except that 1876. It's down at Newcastle Library. Cooper um, don't have anything for it? I, I haven't sent to them yet. But again, like these people, I, I have at least two books on Honus Wagner where they they know that he's there, but I found I found at least two of his books are inaccurate. I was telling you, at the end of the season, um, Newcastle's actually in second place, and Ed Barrows, who's in the Hall of Fame, he gets the third place team Wheeling to play Warren for the championship. Warren's 23 and 8 and they have Richie Wagner and he gets his pitcher that's won 160 games for the National League to come pitch for Wheeling. He has Glasscock who should be in the Hall of Fame and they get beat four games to two and lose the title. I call it New York, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, this, is, this has been unbelievable. i got to tell you, you've had me spellbound here, Rod. Uh, and well, that's I, like six months' work. So. Well, I, having, we've been down that road before, so if anybody can appreciate the work that you've put in to get to this point and beyond, uh, uh, it's incredible. So let's get Rod again.